just a few seconds. Okay. About tak, tak, ja już widzę, że jej już jest na Facebooku. Mm -hmm. Dobra, to ja się włączę w takim razie. Okay. So I think probably we will uh, wait for um, five more minutes just for other people to add. Probably somebody sure. is late. Yeah, of course. So this is being uh, streamed live on live on Facebook. Yes, right. Yeah, on our on the Facebook. Yeah. And do you know how many people are linked into Facebook and are uh, following uh, it? Do you know it's on that or. Uh, so I can check it, but for now, I'm not sure. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, so some more people. No, I just want to be healthy, and the car doesn't Mówię, że jakby mi się coś stało, to by przynajmniej by zdrowiało. Cześć, Klaudia. So on Facebook, currently, there are 13 people watching. OK, that's great. And they can also ask questions and take part in the conversation. Fantastic. I'm not on Facebook, so I really have uh, little familiarity and experience with these things. So that's great. Well. Current conditions make us uh, familiar with this, more familiar. <laughs>
Okay, so I guess then we can we can start the meeting because everyone is uh, uh, people are watching us uh, on yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Sure. So go on. Okay. So yeah, it's already seven past uh, eight. So I think that it's just the right time to start. Okay. So then I'm glad to greet everyone who has joined our today's meeting, organized by the Polish Forum of Young Diplomats, called as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, what are we learning? And of course, I'm glad to present uh, Dr. Uh, Kishan Manoha, Senior Advisor on Freedom of Religion or Belief at the OECE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, who has kindly agreed to participate in our today's meeting. And uh, just uh, our meeting will proceed as following. So we will begin with the first part, about 20 or 30 minutes, uh, Dr. Manoha will tell us about his job, his career, and share his thoughts and ideas on issues of what the pandemic is teaching us about human nature and human relations. And the second part will be dedicated to the discussion related to these topics. So then everybody is welcome to ask questions, comment, and share their opinion. And all in all, I hope that the meeting will be about an hour, no longer than an hour and a half. So and I think now I'm giving the floor to Dr. Kishan Manoha. Thank you, Jenkuya, Margarita, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here online and uh, to uh, be connected with all of you uh, through Zoom and through Facebook and um, to really thank the Polish form of Young Diplomats for this opportunity. I hope you can all hear me okay. My Wi-Fi connection at home is a, bit, a little bit uh, problematic today, but hopefully it'll stay strong and uh, we can remain connected. Um, I, as Margarita mentioned, work for the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Acronym is ODEA here in, in Warsawa, um, in uh, close to the old town and have been here for five years. And you may or may not be familiar with uh, what we do. Uh, the OSC, as you know, is a security organization. It's uh, comprised of 57 participating states. It's the largest regional intergovernmental security organization in the world. Its uh, geographic span is classically from described as from Vancouver to Vladivostok. So the countries represented are a large chunk of the Northern Hemisphere, including all of uh, Europe, more than just the European Union member states and all former states of the Soviet, former Soviet Union and Mongolia added to that. So that's the geographical spread. And it's a security organization with a difference in that security has always been conceived of and understood to be um, the product of uh, three dimensions, three complementary reinforcing dimensions, political and military, economic and environmental, and the human dimension. And ODEA is the principal institution of the OEC that works in the human dimension. And its mandate is to assist the uh, participating states and civil society across the region to promote human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, democratic governance and the rule of law, equality and full, uh, fair, uh, full and free elections um, and tolerance and non-discrimination issues. Um, and the work that I take forward here is in the area of freedom of religion or belief. So uh, whether it be policy advice, whether it be expert advice, whether it be capacity building, organizing meetings, all aimed to advance this human right for all across the region. Prior to that, I should say, I had a very professional career because my first um, calling was medicine. So my title, if you like, is a doctor of medicine, not a doctor of philosophy. And then I trained for some years as a psychiatrist, so mental health issues of psychological, um, emotional and social well-being were my 
area of interest. And then I gave that up, if you like, to pursue a career in the law and particularly in international and human rights, because it had been uh, um, a major issue, a major interest and passion for me right through my medical studies. And eventually I couldn't give up the urge, if you like, to uh, at least study it. And I enjoyed the studies and, and then wanted to go into practice. And so I did, but also alongside that, I was very active as a member of the Baha'i community in the United Kingdom and uh, took forward its work uh, in interfaith relations, in government relations, on uh, advocacy around issues of religious rights in Iran and in South Asia. And that got me into very much this area of religious freedom and minority rights and associated human rights. And eventually ended up coming to Warsaw to work for ODIA. So I never really set out to have a career in, in, in an international organization, but this is where I've ended up. And I'm very happy to, to be here and to be doing this work. And, you know, like everyone else, we have been caught up in the pandemic, um, affected by it personally, because we closed down the office to work from home um, three and a half months ago. And we've had to adapt to a new reality of life uh, from working from home and, but also conducting our activities now online as an organization, rather as staff who travel widely and constantly across the region, we've had to transfer as much as we possibly can, as much as is feasible of our in-person activities to online uh, media, which has been a great lesson and a great learning experience for us. But we've also seen uh, indirectly because we don't visit, of course, but we've heard firsthand through our civil society and other contexts and secondhand indirectly of the impact the pandemic has had on lives and across societies across the region. And it's been really an extraordinary period to see on the one hand, the truly tragic consequences for individuals, for families, for societies, of course, happening in different places to different extents um, with suffering and sorrow prevalent in many people's lives and the social and economic consequences that have followed as a result of the lockdown and other measures that have been taken to protect the health of the public. We've also seen, of course, uh, challenges in the area of fundamental rights and freedoms uh, in the area of the rule of law. Um, which we're still monitoring, of course, and we're still figuring out in a way because we're still very early on and we don't know how things will look once uh, we have fully emerged from the crisis. I don't think um, we can say we have by any means emerged. We are emerging because we don't know what lies around the corner in terms of second and third waves and the responses of governments and the impacts will have on lives, on societies, on our global economy, on our social relationships, on the fabric of society and its institutions, on the political domain, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we're watching this with keen interest and that's one prevalent trend, of course. But on the other hand, we've also been very struck by some other phenomena, by the resilience shown by countless individuals, groups, and communities by the adaptability to a new reality, by the spirit of solidarity that has been awakened uh, among large sections of society. And also struck, and I've been struck both with my institutional hat and also as an individual living in Warsaw and being connected with people here and back in the UK where I'm from and all over the world at the, um, conversations that people are, have been having, whether it be online, through WhatsApp, on the phone, you name it, it's been happening. And the conversations have been really interesting to me because they have, and I'm sure it struck you and, and no doubt you're part of these ongoing conversations because people are really 
revisiting what it means to be human, what really matters to them, asking questions such as, what can I place my hope in? Um, is there hope? Who do I or can I place my trust in? Who am I responsible for? How far does that responsibility extend? Should I think about my rights or my responsibility? How much freedom should I give up for the well-being and the protection of others? How long will this last? What will we look like? Will things change? People hope for positive change. And at the beginning, many people were excited, but then you heard people say, it'll go back to what it was. Some are saying, no, it won't, it can't. You've heard people talk of the pandemic being a great leveler. Everyone's in this together. But we also know that some people have been more badly and adversely affected than others. The inequalities that were pre-existing have seemed to be exacerbated or made harsher as a result, or at least some of them in some places, not all places. So it's a very interesting picture. And so these positive trends that I've just touched on some, and the negative trends run side by side. And I guess the challenge is to see the full picture, uh, not to get um, our minds uh, sort of, uh, if you like, uh, fixated on one or the other or over the other, to look at it in the whole and to discern very carefully what is likely to succeed in the long term. And if we truly believe in a positive, constructive future, how can we align ourselves then with the positive, constructive forces? strengthen them, take them forward, contribute to them, while being aware of the increasing challenges to the well-being of society, to its peace, to its security, to its strength. So to be intelligently aware of where those threats are, uh, because of course they surround us and in, in some cases have, um, or in many cases have been amplified as a result of this situation we're in. So I thought that I would offer just some personal reflections based on all these conversations and observations that I'm um, grateful for to think about a couple of um, what I think are key capacities, principles, concepts that have been, I believe, significantly strengthened as a result of our collective experience to date. And I believe we'll carry on being strengthened in this regard. And that's really what I wanted to share and then to have a discussion around, around these and other issues and, and how we, we move forward because a lot of the discussion has been around uh, bouncing forward rather than bouncing backward, building back together. Some of these are terms used uh, by the United Nations Secretary General or by governments. Uh, commonly we're hearing about the resetting of the um, dimensions of modern life. So how do we actually do this? And what are we learning that will contribute to bouncing forward, to building back better, et cetera, et cetera. And so the first capacity I think that certainly has been strengthened. Now I would say it may not be your experience, it may not be in all places, but it's certainly something I've become keenly aware of, is that this pandemic has taught us that we can be more compassionate, that we can extend the ambit, the sphere of our care to more than just our immediate loved ones and family uh, and friends, to neighbors, to co-workers, to members of our faith communities and beyond social groups, uh, and more widely still, despite, despite the fact that we have been doing this largely under very strict conditions of physical or social distancing. So the domain of care and concern has been to me very striking in terms of how wide and deep it has been. So the capacity to care, to be compassionate, um, and also to feel a degree of responsibility for others, I think is has been quite 
striking um, and, and presence in, in um, many, many places. And I see that as a very promising sign uh, for the future that we have um, um, accepted and prepared to live for a while in a very different, completely different way um, in order to care for each other and to put the health and well-being of all first. That has been quite remarkable, and that has involved sacrifice and giving up things that we prize very much uh, for a period of time for that purpose. Now, there have been exceptions to that. Not everyone has signed up to that. Not everyone may agree to that. But I hope we would. Ex I would hope that the vast majority of people would have accepted by now that the consequences of not doing this would have been devastating for our health individually and collectively. The second thing that's really struck me is um, what I would call a greater sense of connectedness, either expressed at the level of place level of the immediate location, environment, neighborhood in which we might live, but also more broadly as terms of um, at the level of uh, the global whole that is, our, that is our world, our societies, our countries, and that we not just recognize that at the level of concept and principle and thought but actually we've demonstrated or large sections of society have demonstrated in action that our collective strength our collective well-being has depended in large measure to the degree to which we've expressed that connectedness in acts of collaboration unity solidarity fellow feeling um, mutual support over a fairly long period of time and this is an ongoing issue an ongoing challenge and an ongoing need so we've had to work more closely together to do it and there have been abundant examples of this some just happening without us even knowing um, I think of the many wonderful interfaith and multi-faith collaborations that have sprung up in Europe never mind the rest of the world and there are many, many such instances outside of Europe, but even within Europe, area I know best and OSE essentially serves, primarily serves, um, or largely serves, very struck by that degree of collaboration, new initiatives, some existing ones rejuvenated, but many, many new initiatives. Um, there's a real willingness and desire to come together on the part of representatives of many communities um, to do so, that's just one example. But more closer to home is that um, in many cases, this period has um, led to a return of neighborhood life, um, allowing people to, whether they live in the same apartment building, the same stretch of road, the same housing estate, to see them as themselves as part of a community, keeping their spirits up, particularly in the very early days of lockdown, when it seemed that all hope was lost. It was an unparalleled experience, unprecedented experience for all of us, unless you have been a hermit and a recluse, or you've had to be confined to home for other reasons, and some people have, um, for health and other reasons. It was an abnormal experience. So simple things such as help with shopping, advice as to where to go if a light bulb blows, what's open, what isn't. Could you please help me with bearing in mind the restrictions on, on us and the need to keep healthy and uh, a safe distance with certain acts that I, I cannot do, whether it be shopping or buying medicine or whatever it may be. Help and advice about doctors who are available. I mean, it's been people showing a vulnerability, but then reciprocated by a degree of assistance that has been uh, remarkable, but also positive messages posted on um, notice boards in apartment buildings, 
housing estates in the windows of community centers, keeping people's spirits up, because people didn't know how long this would last, the initial phase. We still don't know how long this process that we're going through, this experience we're going through will last, but keeping people's spirits up um, and realizing that uh, we will need to depend on each other in ways that we've never done before. So this sense of interdependence, fellow feeling, connectedness at the neighborhood community level, and as, I, and as I said, beyond that has been very striking. Of course, it hasn't been consistent and one should be blind to the challenges in international collaboration with the uh, uh, challenges to the, I wouldn't say authority, but the guidance provided by say the World Health Organization uh, in, in number and some quarters. But looking at the societal level, at the individual level, I've been very struck by, by this phenomenon of connectedness, of neighborliness, of the sense of mutual interdependence, responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it is interesting, I think it is pertinent that this heightened consciousness of our interdependence, some would call it fraternity, spirit of unity, of oneness has been, um, this already heightened consciousness has been further amplified in recent events following the murder of George Floyd in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement, the calls for racial equality uh, and justice have amplified uh, this uh, call for attention to justice, of course, but in some of the discourse, some of the conversations that have been had, the unmistakable call to recognize um, our oneness as a human race. That is the only race that matters, the human race, and not the artificial racial constructs that have been created to sadly separate or have been used to separate, demarcate um, with claims of supremacy over races seen as inferior, which has left its tragic mark on our lives as human beings for too long, for centuries and continues to do so. And the other thing that has also sharpened uh, our sense of uh, solidarity as a human race one, this is a human race, have been also the parallel calls that have been articulated by many, um, that we mustn't forget the challenges of climate change while we combat the virus, that there are lessons that we're learning from the virus that should carry over to what is in, long, in the long term a equally devastating threat potentially to our lives, which is that of climate change, rapid climate change and the um, effects it's having on our natural world and on our relationship with nature and of course in our, our lives and collective and well-being and security. So these, what I call three phenomena, the virus and the pandemic, if you like, the uh, protests uh, since the murder of George Floyd and others, Black Lives Matter, cause of racial equality and justice, and then climate change, heightening our sense of unity and justice as being two very powerful forces that uh, need to be brought to bear in the quest for building peaceful, inclusive, cohesive societies. So it's looking to that place in the future that I think the lessons we're learning about how we've combated or we're combating the pandemic, um, lessons around compassion and care, responsibility for others, lessons and learnings around connectedness, oneness, solidarity, collaboration. Um, they're promising signs, they're promising learnings, they're promising lessons uh, that we need to take forward in, in building a better future which is what we hope will come out of this process. At least we hope and large numbers wish to work for that. And that's important work. And that's 
is really what I wanted to share some initial thoughts on. There are also some ideas that have been um, in my head around practically how we do this. It'd be great to get your thoughts and what we need to put in place, the mechanisms, the approaches to continue this very important discussion and conversation at all levels in society. So questions around how we consult, how we make decisions, uh, how we bring to the table various varying perspectives, how we make sense of it, our challenges facing all of us, all actors in society, but particularly institutions of governance, political authorities, um, but not only those, civil society, um, reflect very on that. So I'll leave it there and look forward to your thoughts, reflections, questions, ideas, comments. So thank you very much, Dr. Manoho, for the presentation of your vision on the issue. And yeah, now we may start the discussion. So you can either write your questions or comments on the chat or just switch on your microphone and tell them out loud. And of course, we will check the questions on Facebook. Oh, I will check them. Uh, and probably I think that I may start. Uh, so the first thing I was wondering about is, so the conditions, uh, in the conditions of a suddenly collapsed pandemic, uh, an ambiguous process takes place in the society. So as you just mentioned, on the one hand, the trends of solidarity and the mutual support dominate, manifested in the fact that people realize the importance of common efforts in countering the spread of coronavirus and the need to calmly survive the period of self-isolation. While on the other hand, there is egoism combined with carelessness and neglectness in relations to one's health and most importantly to the health of others. And uh, so do you think that this kind of crisis is really the moment when the human essence especially comes out? Or is it so? So the, the, is it the moment when the the when when we can check the the human essence of of people around and of the so just of the humanity yes it does i think it does reveal um, a lot about human nature tendencies um, patterns of thought and action individual and collective it absolutely does because you will have people who will say, under no costs will I allow my freedom to do what I was doing before to be unstopped and checked by something I have no proof really does exist. So people are denying uh, willfully. Um, and that leads to all sorts of acts uh, which are um, problematic, if you like. Uh, or certainly challenging to um, social peace and collective health and well-being. Yeah, people who also do get the gravity of what is happening, but are motivated primarily to protect themselves and get what they can. And you've seen people hoard, you know, foodstuffs and other things from shops for themselves, um, not caring about what will be left or nothing might be left, of course for others who are similarly challenged by the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, the need to uh, keep healthy, keep safe, keep well fed, and to do the same for their families. But the large, vast majority of people have adapted and adapted well, and it's not been easy, but they've demonstrated the positives that have been mentioned by yourself and, and, and I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So it's shown full spectrum of, of human nature, but I think that it's been largely positive and that's a good thing. That's an important thing. We need to be reminded of that. We can do these things and it's not idealistic, naive talk. It's not over optimistic. It's not over reading, I believe, or exaggerating, but it's decent human care and compassion and uh,
it strengthens ultimately my own individual health and well-being. It's just the analogy, the analogy of the human body is instructive in this case, um, to keep every tissue, cell, organ healthy and well, you've got to nourish the entire body. You can't really nourish three quarters of it and protect those three quarters and say, well, the rest of it really can neglect because you know what? Um, I don't need to depend on those things for my overall health and well-being, but you do so at your peril because everything is interconnected. So that analogy I think is very, very useful. I, I think it is appropriate. It's one we can all readily see and agree to. And we know that also the things that can start insidiously, that can start invisibly in one part of the body, in a cell or a tissue that decides to go on its own journey unchecked, unpar uh, unchecked, un, um, uh, selfishly can grow and can grow and can ultimately overwhelm the entire function of the body. And that is the basis of cancer in its most virulent form. So if, as people have seen firsthand, they act selfishly in a supermarket, particularly as we've seen, someone else loses out. If we, if we imbalance, if we create imbalance in our family environment, we soon see the impact of that. We struggle sometimes to see it on a wider global scale, but that actually is what happens all the time. And it counts for gender discrimination. I believe it counts for the unequal resources to name but a few. It's the imbalance, and that can only be best addressed when the frame and the framework for addressing them and resolving them is one, in, one informed by commonality, by uh, considerations of the whole, and by a framework of, of uh, justice for. Okay, so thank you for your answer. And uh, the other thing you've already mentioned, so that the fight in the epidemic, governments have introduced restrictions on democratic issues, and bo but for now there are no generally accepted patterns in limiting human rights because of the epidemic. And uh, many of these restrictions were perceived as brutal acts by some people. So what do you think of it? Does the goal justify the means in this situation? So are the, were those acts really as brutal as some people think, or is it just something needed in this case, in this situation in which we are, we have been for some time already? It is an interesting one to reflect deeply on um, because we're, you know, you, you've had the UN Secretary General, the UN High Commission of Human Rights, heads of human rights institutions speak very powerfully about um, how human rights are essential to combating the pandemic and beyond. Yet at the same time, there are things that have been uh, limited uh, as a result of the measures taken to combat the pandemic. And of course, international human rights law provides for um, the possibility for governments to restrict rights on narrow grounds, including public health. And um, yet those are narrow grounds, those limitations are to be applied uh, in ways that are necessary and proportional. So there's a learning to be done by states around what is necessary at all times and what is proportional. And it's been interesting to see in some cases how um, that logic has been applied through the period of the pandemic to date. That, you know, there was a time to restrict and restrict quickly, but that has to be time sensitive and time limited. And we have to really, really think day after day, week after week, are those things that were put in place on day one still needed? And to really test that. 
And that won't happen unless we listen carefully to relevant voices, relevant actors, civil society, international human rights institutions, um, and learn from other states. And there's emerging good practice that we will need to capture and reflect on to convince people that these things were necessary and that we're learning for the, uh, the next phase. But you know, I'm not surprised that people would question the good faith of governments in these situations. They remain skeptical because sadly, increasing number of governments um, have been abusing um, their powers when it comes to regulation of rights and freedoms and democracy and the rule of law. It is not surprising. People feel skeptical about this and will continue to be skeptical, particularly if, um, as there are some signs in some places, some states will use the pandemic as a cloak, as a smokescreen, as a convenient excuse to repress uh, certain groups, particularly minorities in certain places for an unlimited period of time and to attribute powers that will ensure that they retain power for as long as possible to push through whatever they want to push through. So the checks and balances that exist in international law need to be exercised. People need to speak up. Those in positions to do so need to do so. Civil society still has a role or the, the shrinking space, or the space for it to be active is shrinking in many places. But as long as there is a way of doing so, it needs to be done. There are also concerns, of course, about the medium that we're using all the time now, online. What's, is it safe? Is it secure enough? Is our digital footprint gonna be used against us? So there's thinking going on, there's work going on, and that needs to continue. I think that the independent mandate of institutions like ODIA, other regional international human rights bodies, watchdogs, national human rights institutions need to be preserved at all costs at this time. And they need to continue to shine a light on potential areas of concern and abuse, ongoing violations. But also do one other thing is to educate educate why human rights are important and why sometimes measures are needed to restrict, but to really focus on that which is necessary and proportional as a last resort. So it's part of an ongoing conversation it's to convince skeptics, but at the same time to hold governments to account. So it's quite a bit of work. It's important, it's critical, because I dare say it will, I think we all know it'll come back because it's the nature of these viruses to uh, return. Okay, thank you. So uh, turning to another point, uh, well, currently sociologists say that the pandemic mixed two or rather three important, so to say, life worlds of people. So the world of home, the world of work, and for children, the world of school. And due to the fact that all life has been concentrated now within the apartment or house, uh, different types of problems occur, such as misunderstandings between spouses, difficulties in education of children, a surge of aggression against women and against children. And also in this regard, sociologists predict an increase in divorces. General coronavirus uh, can be called the litmus test for assessing the quality and uh, some extent strengths of family relationships. So uh, do you agree with this point? Yes, I think that, you know, um, it's affected all areas of life, it goes without saying, and has concentrated so much attention on our immediate environment, which is our home environment, and our apartment buildings, we live in apartments, or immediate surroundings outside the home, wherever you are living. Um, and it's deeply unfortunate that for many, the home, which is a place of safety, security and well-being, has also been the place of great tragedy, in some cases, abuse and violence, as you've 
indicated conflicts and problems. So we, there's, there's, there's the immediate issues there that um, our authorities, our societies need to address themselves to how to protect individuals who are at risk in the home environment. I talk to faith community representatives all the time about the issue of how or the role they can play in heightening awareness to the problems that happen in the communities of individuals that are members of those communities, but also within their communities and beyond to really speak to the potential of the home and the family environment to be a place of the greatest nourishing and nurturing, especially in times of crisis, great solidarity, great hope, and how the homes and the families still can and are able to, through the online connections that we have, to unite and connect with other homes, whether it be in the same building or beyond, to find ways to extend that to people who are not living in easy circumstances, people who may be alone or not, li or living with others in other circumstances in which they can remain very lonely or at risk. So in safe ways, appropriate ways to extend that through the means that we have. So the online world is a connection for still for countless millions. And so people who have got strength at home, I think need to export that strength to others to connect people with that source of strength and, and safety and well-being. And that goes back to the acts of service, charity and of assistance they can render. So we have, I think, the ways to connect better with people who are at risk um, and to help people. When it comes to education, I've also been struck by how resilient and adaptable many families, many communities have been in continuing the educational processes that kids, young people have been missing out on, um, whether it be the formal instruction, but also, um, you know, physical activity and exercise and education, but also moral, spiritual, informal education, again, largely online, supporting activities in new creative ways, um, using the arts, uh, as a way to really uh, keep up spirits of hope and positivity. So there are many ways to continue with that outside of the formal settings. Ultimately, we hope, of course, that um, we'll be able to push back the virus to the point that we can return to the physical um, schools, uh, workplaces, may be modified and may be modified for the better, actually, and these things probably perhaps were a long time coming, the virus accelerated it. Um, but, you know, for that to happen, and there's talk of all the time of developing effective vaccines and rolling it out and the rest of it, and yet we hear country X is moving forward and country Y is moving forward and country J is moving forward and country A, and the simple question is, great, but what about collaborating better in this regard? And what we have developed something that is sure that that implementation, that rollout is one that um, is not held back by issues or issues or politicized issues. Uh, that will be done in a way that is fair, that is just, that is inclusive, that is respectful of human rights. Um, otherwise, we're perpetuating the inequalities that exist. But those who are privileged, those who are fortunate, those who are in a particular place at a particular time have access to the vaccine and others don't. And that will be truly, truly tragic, and we will live with those consequences for generations. Thank you, thank you for your answer. So we have one question on the chat. 
So while the pandemic, the internet has become like air, even more integral component of people's lives than it used to be. Do you think that even more virtualization of our lives is something worth worrying about or is rather the other way around a big plus? Well, my short answer is it has numerous advantages and they probably outweigh the disadvantages. And by that, I mean, not just the concerns around safety, security, digital footprints being used by actors in society for all sorts of bad ends. But I also think that one thing that we, I hope will avoid is replacing when it is safe to do so and appropriate therefore in terms of safety and health reasons to do so that we'll not just live our lives virtually, that we'll be out there with people, with each other, doing positive, constructive, meaningful things. Um, perhaps some patterns of the way we socialize will be changed forever and possibly for good reason, but there's so much about human interaction as a social species uh, inherent the sociability of human beings is inherent to who they are, I believe, and we all um, acknowledge that, that would be lost and to our collective detriment if we only lived our lives virtually. For some, they may wish to, and that is their choice, but I hope it doesn't become the, the norm. We'll use it to good effect for good purpose. I can see that uh, in our work, um, uh, it is saving, um, us, the stress and strain of constant travel. It is, of course, preserving our precious natural world from uh, uh, an excessive uh, amount of um, carbon and other uh, noxious fumes and, and pollution and all that. And I think that's welcome. But travel will find its place again. It's important for for the purposes that really advance the causes say that we work for and again to be done in ways that are, are relevant and necessary but largely i think the positives have out, will outweigh the negatives you be vigilant um, and find ultimately the appropriate place of this in our in our future lives and it will have a place perhaps a growing place but not, will not occupy the field totally Okay, thank you for your answer. So uh, as far as I can see on the chat, so Claudia wants to ask a question. So uh, we, are we are given the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manoha for sharing your thoughts and uh, your experience. It's a great pleasure to attend this meeting. Uh, so uh, in the last years, we can observe the phenomenon of the backsliding democracies all over the world. You mentioned the United States, for example, that we used to call the leader of the free world. And um, some of the governments used this extraordinary tools to fight COVID-19 uh, for introducing very questionable legal changes. For example, transgender rights in, the, in, in Hungary. Uh, so uh, my question is about your predictions. Do you think that this kind of global pandemic we experienced might be a change breaker in this uh, tendency, this backsliding democracy tendency, or maybe the opposite? Maybe it's going to make it even, even stronger and even more progressive. Thank you. Thank you. These are all very, very good questions. And you know, you can see both trends. I would like to believe that the constructive positive will win over eventually um, when we realize how dangerous the negative trend is potentially to rights and freedoms for all. But I cannot um, honestly say that I am not fearful that in some places in different places at different times, the pandemic will be used as a cloak to repress, to go after certain groups, certain minorities. Uh, you define that and define them. Whether you recognize as a minority, I, I, I 
strongly believe it will, it will, it is happening and it will happen. And things I said earlier about shining a light on that, calling those governments and states, building greater awareness, capacity in civil society to advocate on behalf of, of, of uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms for all as a strong, ultimately very powerful guarantor of social peace and security, those things will have to be supported, strengthened, continue. So with that awareness, I hope the pandemic will accelerate the positive uh, efforts in society, but against the backdrop of challenges that I think the pandemic has um, exacerbated, potentially accelerated. And that's will be ongoing work. So I don't know how things will look in six to nine months or 12 months or longer. I think it'll be a bit of both, but I, I just don't know. I think the warning signs are there. You've identified some, there are others. Um, and it will put the international human rights machinery to its strongest test. The pandemic has been a gift to dictators and authoritarians around the world. It's been a gift. Um, and insidiously, um, some are plotting where things will be uh, in time to come. So we would need to be ahead of the game, focused um, and open to, I think, not repackaging is not the right word, but in communicating people who are remain skeptical, not because of their anti-rights and their anti the rights agenda, freedom agenda, um, but to communicate to them more clearly in language that resonates uh, with their realities, with their contexts, as to why human rights are important, why they matter, what they bring practically. And will bring to the forefront the so-called second generation rights, the economic, social and cultural rights, rights around rights to health, for example, which I know have been around for some time, but have been getting in some places less attention than they probably deserve. But let's unpack that, let's think that through. Um, housing, employment, all of these things, social welfare, all of these things, social care. We're not gonna build open, cohesive, just societies if we only and primarily think about a certain category of rights over and above others. We have to advance all of them as part of an interconnected whole. And that includes rights to non-discrimination, gender equality. And that's for those future among yourselves, I'm no doubt um, diplomats, politicians, leaders of thought and in society, academics, people in the media, educators, uh, civil servants. Um, and I would say uh, future, if not currently, parents uh, and members of families and communities that it should have our collective attention, all of these issues, particularly those who are moving into the human rights work. There's one thing I would say is we promote one right over another at our peril. Because that's exactly what those who want to really do damage to the system will do. Selectively use rights against the other. There's some good stuff that's come out around the communication of human rights at this time, um, moving away from jargon, looking at substance, what human rights do practically, why we need them at this time as we emerge and move forward. So that sort of stuff can be very useful and get that out there to, uh, to the younger generations, to students, high school, elementary, high school, as we call it in the UK, secondary school, universities, get that out there have those conversations. It's a big challenge and I think it'd be great if, if Polish young diplomats and other groups in Poland, 
in this context would do it. Like educational work it can be done largely on well, it can a lot of it can be done was done be done online anyway. So yeah, use the space, have those conversations. Sure. Get people get people sure. thinking. Thank you so much. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, we have one rather psychological question from Evgeny on Facebook. So he asks, uh, many people wonder where to take strengths when around us there is such an atmosphere of mistrust, of fear, of panic, of void, of obscurity. Uh, so how would you answer this question? Interesting question, good question. Um, these are natural human reactions. I think anyone who says, oh, I've never had a, a moment, stress, anxiety uh, at this time, wow, they were Superman or Superwoman, a super person, I haven't met one. It's natural to be anxious, it's natural to panic, it's natural to worry, and it's natural to seek comfort in a strange way, and security, in a strange way. And I guess this is the uncomfortable, sometimes unpalatable thing we need to reflect on, is that some people take comfort and security from a tribal approach. Prime puts the primacy on the survival of the tribe or the nation far-right movements exploit that, ultra-nationalist movement exploit that, neo-Nazis exploit that. But there's a kernel of truth in, in the quest, in, in, in not what they're saying, but what they're aspiring to, which is a visceral safety. Where do we get security that is in line with the very best interests of the human race is something to think about. Um, where to derive hope and comfort from is something to really think about. For large numbers, that is religious faith or other systems of belief. It has been very interesting reading um, accounts of uh, by people who started off the pandemic as religious believers and others who've come into religious faith in recent weeks and months as to why and how their faith has sustained them how it's provided comfort in very difficult times. But a comfort and strength that is outward looking, that doesn't privilege themselves or their families or tribes or nations, but looks at the best interests of society and sees ultimately in their, uh, in their own personal growth, in their personal strength, the capacity to help others has given them great meaning, making them realize that everything is relative. I may be having problems in these areas, but my health, thank goodness, is intact. I've got a roof over my head, but others are not so fortunate. What can I do? And through helping, through acting in that way, serving, you gain greatly you gain greatly um, so nothing wrong about showing your vulnerability nothing wrong about showing anxiety it's how you channel it some will channel it in ways that are destructive and dangerous many many we do it in ways that ennoble um, that cultivate a very um, positive virtues values and qualities not just the individual's benefit, but the benefit of others as well. And a large source of that has been religious faith. Not the only source, but it's a large source. And that's been very striking as I've observed reactions from large numbers of people over this period of time. Thank you for your answer. So we have one more question on the chat. Uh, together with the pandemic itself, emerged the problem of the so-called infodemia speculations, various rumors, fake news, which are sometimes even worse than the virus itself. How can we deal with this? Unfortunately, that has been the case from day one or day zero. 
um, ill-informed, sometimes terribly misinforming for very unseemly ends to sow the seeds of doubt, prejudice, stereotype, stigmatize, very dangerous. And in the long term, worse than the virus itself, yes. How do you counter it? Well, you counter it in many different ways. I think individuals have to take responsibility for, for what they know, what they learn, what they understand. I, um, you know, I think ultimately we have to do a reality check. Um, large numbers of us were living largely online, a great deal of our time online, spending a lot of time connecting with people through digital media and other uh, technologies. And you can see sometimes how you can end up in uh, uh, hardening positions for the sake of it. You, you sort of, it, it's subtle, it comes on slowly. You begin to take on a caricature sometimes of, of, of um, or an exaggerated version of yourself in terms of sticking to certain views, um, which are uh, not based on an objective reading of reality. So I think it's going to be our individual determination to check sources, to be rigorous, to be fair-minded, to think, to ponder, to reflect, to do that also in the company of others that we can trust, that are willing to challenge us and ask them. So if someone says, oh, this is caused by X, this virus has been produced by whatever uh, uh, fabricated, it's not really happening, or if it is happening, it's been carefully, deliberately planned for decades by this group or that group. Well, okay, that's the view, however crazy it may be. Um, test it, challenge it, look into it, help others who are struggling to know what's going on because you may feel that's just rubbish. I don't, and I have no time for it. I don't want to read into it, but others do. And that can be built ahead of steam online, particularly as people exist, as I said, in these sort of echo chambers. So you need to find that to, to counter it. And there are ways to say safe online. Uh, a number of um, uh, tech companies are, and social media platforms are issuing guidelines on how to stay safe online, how to check your sources, how to look at the, the counter evidence, where to find the counter evidence. Um, but ultimately you've got to really develop the qualities in and of yourself to be curious, to quest, to be part of a wider process of, of generating knowledge and sharing knowledge um, with others and understanding. And that's a lifetime's commitment. And I think that it's important that families talk about these things. Parents talk about these things with their children um, as they navigate these challenges online. But it's part of a questing independently questing mind um, to ask these questions and not to fear those questions, have a ludicrous or silly they may be, because often they do help uh, unravel greater levels of truth. And then there's also the very powerful tool of um, conversation and consultation, where you seek in a dispassionate way to come to a greater level of understanding. And I think part of our problem is that we stop believing that we can agree on things as individuals, as groups, even as families, as societies, that we've lost the art of, of achieving consensus. We've lost the art of really truly talking objectively and dispassionately because we hold on to our views too stubbornly, too rigidly. We, for whatever reason, for fears, anxieties, because we think we're right and self-righteous, we don't give up. We hold on at all costs. So we need to develop new habits, new habits of mind and of expression to allow us to really reach 
a common understanding of things. And that is not easy, especially we, do, we believe that can no longer be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So uh, we have one person who, who would like to ask the question. Uh, sorry, but just the sign says Ericsson thing. So we are giving you the floor. Hi there, uh, Dr. Matulka. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, coming to us <clears throat> and speaking about this. Um, I'm actually just quite curious about um, some of the human rights, let's say, um, uh, issues that, you, that you've that you mentioned um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Could you expand or elaborate more on some cases that it's worth noting on uh, in the international realm in terms of human rights violations uh, during this pandemic? Um, well, you have a one, one issue that we've been working on, or I, I certainly with colleagues have been working on at ODEA is tracking the impact of um, rising levels of deliberate misinformation, which uh, and conspiracy theories, which has led to stereotyping, negative stereotyping, stigmatization of certain groups in society, certain ethnic religious minorities who have been held to be responsible for the origin of the virus or the spread of the virus. Um, and as a result, have either led to authorities or groups in society um, repressing those groups, attacks on those groups, greater levels of hate speech and hate crime against those groups, discriminating against those groups. Those all constitute discrimination uh, a human rights violation there and then. So if you're saying in country X that it's these people because of the way they live their lives, the way they live, the way they practice their faith, the way they congregate, you can see that they've just behaved in ways that allow this virus to start and to grow and to develop. And therefore we should go after them. We should attack them now or in the future or now and in the future, bar them from entering schools, places, public places, deny them employment, which is sadly happening in countries, or in some countries, those are classic human rights violations. And when the state turns a blind eye, doesn't act, doesn't intervene, it's complicit with it. It's not living up to responsibilities to protect them from those socially driven violations, or the state itself decides to detain a whole bunch of people um, who are going around um, uh, to uncover um, and reveal the truth of the state's own weak, inappropriate, careless response to protecting public health. So human rights defenders, media professionals, detained, in some cases worse than detained in terms of torture, in terms of uh, physical abuse, but just telling the story as they believe is happening. Other examples of violations that are happening in various parts of the world today. So these things are serious. Um, they won't go away as long as society and the state have those attitudes as we have, as people predict, further waves of the pandemic or other issues associated as a result, these are problems and real issues. Um, as an OSCE OD official, I am careful not to name and shame states. That's why I'm not coming out with, with names of places and people and actors. But these also happen in the region served by the OSCE. Sadly. 
Thank you for your answer. So uh, coming back to the issue of distance school education, um, many people believe that distance education is devoid of the human component and it doesn't allow the child to socialize, which is an important element of the educational process. So do you agree with this opinion? I'm not a, an expert in matters of education, but I would say yes, I, I you know, it is the nature of children, young children, say particularly that group, uh, to play, to play with each other, to learn about those interactions physically. Now, one of the things we do know about the virus is it doesn't, largely doesn't spread amongst young children. So there's hope that with the right measures in place, and all parents should be forced, of course, to do things uh, that will put their children's lives and others in, in, in risk. There is hope that, you know, the impact will not be as long lasting or severe, but I say that I'm prepared to be corrected because the evidence that there may be child specific COVID symptoms and syndromes is, is emerging and may well uh, be um, a decisive factor in whether schools will reopen for how long. But yes, I think that area is, is if not attended to the uh, socialization, um, the play, the what it's like to be with others and learn about the lives of others from being with them every day, day in, day out, experiencing diversity in a natural way, which you can't reproduce online. You just cannot reproduce online. Um, so how we get around that while, while attending to the virus, preserving the health of all is a big ask because you could say, great, children don't spread the virus and catch the virus, but adults do, um, among themselves, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So we're to think about all of these things. That's why from a scientific medical point of view, the effective, elusive, effective vaccine rolled out in society. Um, becomes even more critical. So one hopes there's a temporary pause on educational efforts because there's a degree to which you cannot replicate them online. It's also not just about children, it's about all students, including tertiary level university and college level students, because that social experience of university years, of college years, is a very important one. Particularly for children who, or young people who haven't experienced that because of, of other factors in their lives. They weren't able to go to a school for a long period of time with peers and develop those friendships and they had yearned to do that at university. If that's being put on hold, what do they do? They may not have the luxury of taking time off and working to go back. It may not be possible. They have to complete their education on time. They may be in debt and that has to be paid back. In, in some places, educational fees are hugely expensive and they can't be deferred forever and ever. You can't go um, easily and find work um, before you can return to, to study and complete your degree to then work and pay back whatever debts remain. So all, all these things have to be thought through. They're not easy. They're not easy decisions, but Governments have to give careful thought to all of these things because the future health of society in its wider sense depends on all of these things uh, moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I do agree with you. So, and we have uh, another question from Facebook. Uh, so, uh, what habits do you think will pass into the ordinary life of people when the pandemic will end? Should we prepare for the fact that the desire of people to limit interpersonal contacts, crowded communication, handshakes, and kisses will continue? Well, they've been put on hold in uh, um, in many, many places. I've seen here in Warsaw, people have a meeting up and kissing, embracing, handshaking. Um, and no doubt, we'll see more of it. I, I don't think that will stop. It may have been modified in light of current health concerns and they remain. So I tend not to do it myself. I don't do it because I, I don't want to put anyone uh, 
inconvenience or, 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 or imperil anyone's health because I don't know at any one time if I'm an asymptomatic carrier and also my own health. But I would hope in due course, it'll be great to return to that, that degree of physical uh, closeness and contact. Now, of course, in some societies that was never what people did anyway and don't do. So, you know, I think we ought to understand these are not universals. They are in Europe, uh, prevalent to a large degree. Uh, let's see how we work with that. Um, what habits, other habits will pass? I think it will be, you know, being more careful, being more careful. If we know, for example, that the virus can spread through sharing drinks and food, well, you know, I don't know about everyone else, but I grew up and friends of mine grew up and, and we were taught not to do it because germs spread that way. And yes, people occasionally did get sort of germs and a bit ill the next day. And the virus, coronavirus spreads that way. So it's simple, basic, good ways of living. So I hope some of those habits will pass. We'll just be a bit more careful about also um, how we um, interact in, in certain personal ways. Just sort of think it through for ourselves reasonably and sensibly. But there'll be a return to some good old ways of living, which I think have kept societies healthy in previous periods of plague and pestilence. They probably were born out of those periods of time and will need to return to those in a new era of pandemia and beyond. Um, but the social dimension, I don't know. There is value in it, um, but again, exercise with care and caution and with respect to the needs of others. And I think it's just being attuned to the needs and the vulnerabilities of others that is important, including the young and the old, the infirm and the unwell. All of those are positive habits which we can cultivate. So anything that stood in the way of that, um, I think will, will pass and pass for good, for good measure. But if you're saying, um, what about say large scale gatherings such as concerts, sporting events, religious gatherings, I don't know. There's a great thrill when thousands of people get together and cheer on their own football, UK cricket or rugby or tennis player. Um, it's a great thrill, a great rush. Um, people will be very sad to see that go. It's not the same online. How can it be? Um, the collective expression, same with collective worship. But there may be a time and a place to just put that on hold and return to it in ways um, that will be safe and secure, modified, um, but hopefully we won't still lose a centrality of that experience. That is a, an interesting one to think about. Um, but maybe there'll be new ways to gain experience in, in configurations of human beings uh, in, in new, different, new and different configurations, including online. But also I think that there's something here around people who feel the need to only do things collectively that they only feel safe and secure and happy and well and have a meaningful life when they're out, out, out with large, large groups of people. Sometimes doing things that are not entirely meaningful and ultimately productive or constructive, they have to judge that. Um, and spending a bit more time on themselves at home or wherever they are, working on themselves individually, growing deeper into themselves, creating meaning, purpose, fulfillment, a sense of wholeness through individual acts. Could be reading, meditation, yoga, prayer, worship, thought. And those are good things. Those are important things. And I think if there's a balance between that individual and the collective, that's good. And it may well be as a result over time, um, the focus on the individual, and I don't mean feeding the ego, or this insistent self, but the healthy bits of our self will mean we'll emerge um, with new aspirations in society, 
um, and new configurations of social life will give us meaning, things that we haven't yet discovered. So that'll be interesting, that'll be good, that will be promising in many respects, and that we have to learn about. So let's see where that takes us. Sure, just so what is left for us just to wait and see. Uh, okay, as far as I can see, as unfortunately we are running out of time and uh, no more questions appear. So then I would like just to thank uh, Dr. Kian for, for such an interesting meeting, for, for sharing your ideas, your opinion. And uh, thanks everybody who has been present and active. Thank you all Thank for the you. chance. Um, great questions, really interesting questions, a lot for us to think about and wish you all very well uh, in your individual and collective endeavors. Thank you, Margarita, for your moderation and organization, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. It was nice to know you and to meet you. And wishing you all continued you. good health. Thank you. For you as and well. Best. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.